In this video, I am going to introduce dream routing, why we do it, and some of the basic equations that we use. So here's an example of a large watershed where we can think of it as two sub-watersheds. The first one is here, this light green watershed, we'll call that one. And then we have the darker green sub-watershed, and we'll call that two. So we can use a unit hydrograph or a synthetic unit hydrograph to find Q out of this subbasin. But what if we want to know Q2? Okay, what if we want to know what happens as the flow moves down this part of the river right before the second watershed distributes into the same waterway? In order to do this, we are going to use stream routing. And stream routing is used to determine the outflow hydrograph at a location downstream from an inflow hydrograph. So in this case, what I have labeled here as Q out would be your inflow hydrograph, and then Q2 would be your outflow hydrograph. So if we use the high unit hydrograph to figure out Q out, maybe this is Q out coming out from that first subwatershed, we want to know what happens to that flow when it gets to Q2. And in general, it's going to end up looking something like this because of the way that the channel changes. But we would like some way to quantify that. And so we are going to use stream routing. We're going to use hydrologic stream routing, which is a generalization and doesn't get into the nitty gritty details of the uh, hydrodynamic equations. So let's take a look at the basic equations involved in stream routing. This is really going to go back to what we sort of started the quarter with in a mass balance. So we're going to look at a mass balance equation which is going to have inputs minus outputs equal to the change in storage over some time. This here, which means break it up over delta t, and that is going to lead to the following equation i1 plus i2 divided by 2 minus o1 plus o2 divided by 2 is equal to s2 minus S1 divided by delta T. Okay, so here's the equation we're going to start with. And I'm going to show you a little more closely what each of these terms mean. So this first term, the I1 plus I2 divided by 2, this is the average inflow in that time, delta T. The O1 plus O2 divided by 2 is the average outflow in delta T. And then S2 minus S1 over delta T is the change in storage. So the subscripts 1 and 2 represent different time periods, time 1 and time 2. So let's take a look at just like a picture of what this might look like. So on the top, we have what's happening at T equals T1 the first time. You have your storage, S1, and then you have some inflow and some outflow. And then after the prescribed time, delta T, you have T equals T2, and you have your inflow into your S, set, S sub 2, and then the corresponding outflow. And that's the basic set of equations that we use for stream routing. And really now, our job is to figure out how to write an equation for the storage and the inflow and the outflow. And there's many ways to do this. 
um, we are going to look at what is called the Muskingum method, and we're going to look at it for stream routing. You can There's another slight variation for reservoirs, um, but we're going to look just at streams. Okay, so the Muskingum method for stream routing, this was derived in 1930s for flood protection in Muskingum River, Ohio, which is how it's got its name. And the basis for the Muskingum method is to think of the storage piece, so your S1 and your S2, as comprised of two parts. It's going to have a storage that we call prism and then a storage from the wedge. So your storage is composed of two parts, the prism and the wedge. And so we can write this as S is equal to K, I'll define that in a minute, times O, your outflow, plus K times X times I minus O. If we had steady flow, this would suggest that our storage was not changing and our inflow would be equal to our outflow. And this would all be carried in the prism portion of the storage. Okay, so that prism represents sort of a steady flow. And then the unsteady flow is captured in the wedge portion of the storage. And so the KO, that represents the prism. And this K times X times I minus O, that is the wedge. So let's define these two, these two parameters, K and X. So X is a dimensionless coefficient or, weigh, or weighing factor, and it represents the storage effect on routing. It's also a type of diffusion factor. It serves to lower the peak, which is what we expect to happen as you move downstream. And it spreads out the hydrograph. This term is dimensionless. And ranges between 0 and 0 0.5. And if you have a value of about 0.01 to 0.3, that would represent a natural stream. So K is our store coefficient, storage coefficient or routing parameter. This has units of time. And this accounts for the travel time of the peak from through the piece of storage. So in our example um, at the beginning, it would be from the outflow of that first watch sub watershed to the outflow of all of them. And this is a function of the reach length and size of the flood. So let's combine all these equations and see how we apply the Muskingum method and use it. So I'm going to start with the equation that I wrote previously for storage. So that looks using our K and our X. So S is equal to k times o plus k times x times i minus o. So this is the general form. But we want to go back also to our equation that we discretized. So that looks, so again, that looks like this. So I'm going to plug in for s1 and s2 into this equation. I'm going to call this equation 1.
Okay, so now I'm going to write S1. I'm going to discretize this. And so I have S1 and S2 in terms of O1 and O2. We are going to take these two equations and plug them in to equation number one. So now once you plug those into equation one, I'm going to solve for O2, do some rearranging, and you will have O2 is equal to CO times I2 plus C1 times I1 plus C2 times O1, where these CO, C1, and C2 are coefficients, which are quite complicated. So I'm going to pause this and write them and come back.